It's my great pleasure to, to introduce my fellow moderator for this session, Dr. Heather Moss, who is a physician scientist, and uh, she studies uh, several parts of neuro-ophthalmology. She directs the Innovative Clinical Research Program and Biomarker Discovery at the Mary M. and Sash A. Spencer Center for Vision Research, established at the Byers Eye Institute, Stanford. And her clinical and research interests really focus on idiopathic intracranial hypertension, optic neuritis, multiple sclerosis, and she's going to take us through some of the mechanisms of visual loss in papilledema. Great to be co-moderating with you, Heather, today. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Kathleen, although I wish we all got to be in Palo Alto together. So these are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to this presentation. So what I wanted to talk to you a bit today is the closing talk for this session um, is to think a little bit about papilledema, which is a different optic neuropathy from optic disc drusen, but I think can give us some insights into it. And then also to compare and contrast how the patterns of vision loss from papilledema, optic disc drusen, and glaucoma, which we just heard about from Young, um, differ and what, how that can inform our thinking. So papilledema specifically, as I'll refer to it today, is the swelling of the optic nerve related to high intracranial pressure. And the basic mechanism is the following. Around the brain is cerebral spinal fluid, and that cerebral spinal fluid also bathes the optic nerve, shown here in purple, in the optic nerve sheath. And when pressure in that fluid goes up, it exerts a force on the optic nerve. And this can cause a couple of different things as shown in the magnetic resonance images and OCT images of the back of the eye. So on the left are images of a normal subject without high intracranial pressure, and on the right are images of subjects with high intracranial pressure. Um, and you can see that there is a flattening of the back of the eyeball as shown in red. There is also a bowing in of the peripapillary Brooks membrane as shown in yellowish orange. And then you also get swelling of the optic nerve head, which is papilledema here. And so as uh, Shannon already talked about very nicely in her talk, um, one of the most obvious overlaps with optic disc drusen is that papilledema and optic disc drusen both cause elevation of the optic nerve head in the back of the eye. So the two lower images here show that uh, the optic nerve, as we'd see on a clinical exam, and on the left is a papilledema patient, and on our right is an optic disc drusen patient. And neuro-ophthalmologists like to get together and discuss all the different ways we can distinguish these clinically, but the fact of the matter is sometimes it's hard. And optic disc drusen, although they are a problem and can cause blindness, um, papilledema can cause that too. New papilledema is an issue because it could potentially represent something deadly that's causing high pressure in the brain, such as a brain tumor or venous sinus thrombosis. Um, we can also look at OCT, our favorite ophthalmic imaging technique shown in the upper images, um, and then that can give us a little more insight into what's causing it. So you can see that the papilledema disc kind of has this um, sort of bowed in, almost upside down U-shaped, um, as opposed to the optic disc drusen disc. And then you can also see the drusen disc, you can see the drusen on OCT, which helps us to figure that out. But there's also sort of some more general scientific overlap, which that vision loss in papilledema is due to optic nerve dysfunction. And that is also the cause ultimately of vision loss in ODD and glaucoma. And so in this uh, image here, uh, this beautiful image, which is showing the retinal nerve fiber layer as it comes off of the disc. So on the left side of the image is the optic nerve where it plugs into the back of the eye. And then the fibers of the optic nerve are splaying out throughout the retina in these arced patterns. And the central vision is this shadow in the vision, in the vision here. And so in all of these diseases, optic disc drusen, glaucoma, NAION, papilledema, it's the dysfunction of the optic nerve that causes most of the vision loss. And when you get to irreversible vision loss, it's actually the death of the ganglion cells that uh, form the optic nerve that is the problem. And so they're the cable that takes the vision back to the brain. And if they're not working, it doesn't matter if the brain is working and the front of the eye is working, the information isn't getting through. Now, what we do to clinically distinguish them is that the optic nerve head appearance can change. So in papilledema and optic dystrusin, we see a paleness of the optic nerve when the ganglion cells are injured. In glaucoma, what you see is a cupping of the optic nerve um, as the uh, 
ganglion cells prune down. And then the correlates that we see on OCT was we, we can measure the thickness of the, of the layers of the retina where the ganglion cells live, and when they die, we see thinning of those layers. Now, one of the big challenges is that this varies highly between individuals. As has already been mentioned, some people with high, pressure, high intracranial pressure lose vision, some people don't. Some people with high intraocular pressure lose vision, some people don't. Some people with optic dystrusin lose vision, and some people don't, and we don't completely understand why. So one of the unique things about papilledema um, is this idea that vision loss can recover. So here's a case that was published in the literature of a patient who came in on day zero, vision's pretty good on their visual field, um, and then they have sudden vision loss in the right eye. And so you can see the severe vision loss in the visual field. They also have some um, vision loss starting in the left eye too. Um, then they go on to get um, treatment. Um, and you can see that the vision loss starts to improve in the left eye and in the right eye as well. And so that's a really interesting thing because it suggests that the ganglion cells started to have dysfunction and cause vision loss but then with aggressive treatment, they could be pulled back and recovered. And so identifying whether there's reversible, irreversible vision loss would be very interesting. So we think that the reason that vision loss happens in papilledema is mostly a mechanical one. So as I mentioned, you have the loading forces that are acting on the globe shown here in orange, the optic nerve uh, shown in purple, and then also the optic nerve sheath shown in black from this high pressure in the space. And anytime you have pressure on an object, you're going to cause stress, which is force in that object. And you're also going to cause strain, which is deformation of the tissue. And these induce biological changes in the tissue since this is a biological system. And I've talked a lot about the indirect structural changes in, papil in bedding for papilledema which we see on exam. And then we also see the functional changes in how those cells transmit vision, causing vision loss. And there's a variety of other things that we see in papilledema too, which I won't go into today. So what causes all of this in papilledema is thought to be axoplasmic stasis, which is a question that came up earlier today. So here is a stylized optic nerve. This is the vitreous up here. This is the optic nerve head. Here we have the optic nerve behind the eye, and this hatch space is the CSF. And you have blood vessels supplying the optic nerve and the retina. On the right, when pressure goes up, you exert a pressure on the optic nerve, and these ganglion cells, these white tubes, the axoplasm in them isn't able to flow down back towards the brain like it normally does, and so it builds up, and this is axoplasmic stasis. You can see this on these electron micrographs where the ganglion cells are swollen. So it's actually an intracellular collection of fluid as opposed to extracellular. Um, and indeed, in this study, they injected tracer into the vitreous and then uh, looked at the pathology and the tracer builds up uh, at the lamina cribosa, which is where you get this buildup of axoplasm. So the cellular physiology is disrupted. This leads to both the appearance, the swelling, and the visual dysfunction. A second thing that can happen that may play an important role is blood flow compromise. So here there's ischemia um, where because the uh, high pressure is actually pressing on the blood vessels and disrupting blood flow. This may also contribute to axoplasmic stasis because it's an active process of the cell and it may also contribute to retinal ganglion cell death. So one of the big questions that we'd like to consider today, perhaps later in our discussion, is why doesn't everyone lose vision? And this is a question in all optic neuropathies, but for papilledema, one of the explanations might be mechanical. So these are mechanical models of the optic nerve head. Um, and if you look at the different regions of tissue, whether it's prelaminar neural tissue in the eye, the lamina cribosa, or the retrolaminar optic nerve, um, you can see that as intracranial pressure goes up, um, that particularly these uh, tensile forces in the retrolaminar uh, optic nerve go up. Um, and indeed, this may be responsible for causing some of the vision loss. So what determines the reversibility of vision loss is another question. Perhaps it's just a matter of degree of injury that you cross over some cliff at some point where you can't recover the cell function. 
Um, or it could also relate to the cause of the ganglion cell dysfunction. So for example, perhaps axoplasmic stasis, if it's a disruption of cellular physiology is something that's recoverable, but if there's ischemia that happens, then that's not going to be recoverable. And so some of the big questions in this field are how can we identify those at risk of progression and how can we identify those with potential to improve? Because those are the ones that we'd like to target our therapies to so that we can both recover vision and prevent vision loss. And so there's lots of overlap opportunities when we think about optic dystrusion and papilledema beyond the clinical question of how do we differentiate them so that we can counsel and treat patients appropriately. So that's the first issue is the diagnosis. So a lot of the literature that pertains to papilledema and how we image the optic nerve head, we can translate to optic dystrusion to try and get better pictures of these optic dystrusion. Obviously, we're very interested in the major morbidity of both of these diseases, which is blindness, which we would like to prevent, um, as stated so eloquently by our uh, patient at the, started off this symposium. But there's a lot to be learned from the pathophysiology. And I think, for example, both studying of human disease and animal models with different optic neuropathies can provide insights relevant to all optic neuropathies, including optic dystrusion. And particularly, both optic dystrusion and papilledema really are an axonopathy. So it's injuring the axon of the optic nerve and both have some overlap in that there's probably a role for mechanical impingement of the ganglion cells. And finally, as Dr. Barris alluded to, there's this question of cause. So there's a couple of papers that support, that report concurrent dextrusin and papilledema. There's one larger retrospective case series, um, which does have some bias in how the diagnoses were classified, but it does raise this interesting question. Do drusen arrive from sick axons? And does papilledema cause sick axons? And so might you get drusen after papilledema that then cause problems? And I think that's an open question that really still needs to be addressed. So with that, I'll close with a lot of questions, which is the point of the symposium today and having the Optic Disc Drusen Center so that we can start to answer them. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Heather. That was really good. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, one is the presence of optic dystrusin uh, always anterior to lamina cabrosa suggests any abnormal translaminar gradient is pushing anteriorly like papilledema, not posteriorly like glaucoma. So could glaucoma treatment worsen the translaminar gradient rather than improve it? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, as uh, you know by answering this question, there is a um, theory of glaucoma pathogenesis that intraocular pressure is high and then intracranial pressure is low and that might cause together the balance of pressure to push out of the eye. Whereas in high intracranial pressure, um, you could theoretically worsen it. So people have looked at whether high pressure in the eye might actually protect from vision loss the problem is in papilledema, the problem is that it's quite a challenging experiment to do because as a natural experiment, it doesn't happen very often and the animal experiments are tricky. Um, so I think the jury is out. It is interesting to note that one of our main treatments for high intracranial pressure is Diamox or acetazolamide, which actually is also an intraocular pressure lowering agent. So using that on balance does seem to be helpful, um, but I don't think anybody's teased out yet the relative effects of high IOP and uh, high CSF. Um, and certainly with glaucoma, it's a little bit of a dicey proposition to increase intraocular pressure to try and counter increased intracranial pressure. And another question came from Emily Carter. Can ganglion cells regenerate under any circumstance? Uh, so that is an excellent question, anticipating some of the talks to come. Uh, I am not a ganglion cell biologist, but one of the big problems is that although from certain kinds of dysfunction they can recover, as I showed in my papilledema example, um, and Dr. Sun earlier talked about how in glaucoma you could have these pre-parametric changes where perhaps you had the opportunity to intervene and prevent vision loss. Once the ganglion cells die, there's currently no way in humans to make them regenerate. Although there's lots of wonderful active research going on at Stanford and elsewhere, um, including looking at uh, potential stem cell therapies and other things, and we'll start to get into those opportunities later today. Great. 